Good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome to our Talent Cafe. Very happy to have you all here and to join us once again for <clears throat> the, the next Talent Cafe. We're very excited about this. Johan is going to share uh, a topic that's very close to my heart as an industrial psychologist and as a, a practitioner of psychometric assessments. Uh, we're very happy to have Johan with us to share um, how we build a business case for the use of psychometric assessments from an HR perspective, obviously convincing the, the finance people, the decision makers as to why we should be using psychometrics. Um, so Johan, I'm gonna allow you to introduce yourself. Um, I hope everybody had a look uh, already at your LinkedIn profile uh, to check out who you are and, and, and what you do. Um, but I'm gonna hand over to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and we're looking forward to hear what you have to say. Thanks, Kuhn. I really appreciate the opportunity. It's always such an honor and privilege to be spending time with, with fellow peers. Um, it's also always nerve-wracking when you, when you speak to the converted and the informed. Um, but, but thank you for the opportunity. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm from South Africa. Um, I'm an industrial psychologist that started a business called The Human Root in 2013. Um, I received my... Um, a master's degree um, in industrial psychology from Stellenbosch University. Um, and I just want to take you through the vision of our organization. I think that's quite, quite important to start. Um, so our vision as an organization is to inspire individuals and organizations to expand their perspectives and create a world where everyone can be significant, where everyone can reach their full potential, where everyone contributes meaningfully, where everyone can be at their natural best and where everyone is energized by the work that they do and the organizations that they work for. That's really um, our why. If you know the work of, of, of um, Simon Sinek, you'll, you'll understand, find your why. Um, and the way we actually achieve our vision, of, or one of the ways, is through psychometric assessments. And I'll take you through the logic behind that and also the thinking behind that. Because I just want to um, put up front on the table, I've got a four-year-old running around in my house and as per the new normal, um, she very often <laughs> um, um, just knocks on my door and comes and sits on my lap. So if that does happen, apologies for that. I'll do my best just to continue with the, the presentation. Um, then secondly, Kun, it's, it's actually quite interesting when you spoke about finance and HR. Uh, my mentor, Dr. Wim Meiberg, uh, many years told me, you know what the problem is with, with HR and finance is the one speaks um, Excel and the other, power, other speaks PowerPoint. And that's very often why we find this, this conflict between um, HR mm -hmm. and, and finance. Guys, I know it's a bit strange on Zoom um, to make this session interactive. Very often it, it, when I have these sessions, it feels like I'm just talking to my screen. But please interact <laughs> with me. If you've got a question, stop me. I tend to speak quite, quite fast. At any stage, if you've got a question, if anything is unclear, then... And just, just raise your hand or, or, or stop me and I'll try and attend to that or I'll attend to any questions afterwards as well. Yep. I'll be monitoring the chat box if there are any questions in there um, and I tend to chip in as well. So Perfect. Yes, I hope no. you don't feel like you're just chatting at your screen. <laughs> I'm, I'm very happy with that. I've also become more comfortable just to chat to my screen. <laughs> so it's, I think it's, as I say, it's part of the new, part of the new way of working. Um, okay. So let's, let's get into the, into the nitty gritty. So I think the one thing that's very important to understand in modern organizations is that the top left picture on your screen at the moment doesn't represent the reality of organizations. Um, it doesn't re represent the reality of the world of work. Um, the world of work is full of turmoil. There's lots of rapids around. It's a fast moving river. Um, and organizations actually need people in the organization that can navigate uh, the turmoil, turmoil river. So it's critically important for organizations to make sure that they actually appoint people that can cope with the, the current demands of organizations and of work. Um, I mean, 2020 is a, is a brilliant example of that. Who could have predicted um, this year and, and the turmoil that we went through this year? It was absolutely unpredictable. Maybe Bill Gates had some sort of vision around it, but um, definitely the rest of us were, were kind of left in the dark about what the reality of 2020 would entail. So, so it really is important um, to understand that the world is becoming more VUCA. You're probably all um, familiar with that term. It's definitely becoming more volatile. It's becoming more uncertain. There's a lot more complexity and it's definitely becoming more ambiguous. 
And I think that's going to be a permanent feature of life. It already is, but I think the world will become more complex as technology evolves, um, as AI enters our world, um, there's definitely going to be more turmoil, more VUCA in our lives. And I think it's critically important for organizations to understand that and to also appoint people into the organization that can actually cope with that and, and, and manage that effectively. So I always like to start the, the, these types of sessions just by taking a step back and really zoning in on why organizations actually exist. So it's a, it's a simple, this is... Um, kind of finance 101 or economics 101 but but essentially an organization exists because we use inputs to convert them to outputs and those outputs are either in the form of a product that we sell to the market or um, a service that we that we um, provide to the market and the one very very important thing that that people tend to miss is that it's not organizations that perform it's not actually organizations yes there's pro processes, there's technology that, that um, makes this conversion process more effective. But the essence and the fundamental core of productivity sits in people. So the value of this three cycle um, value creation process is really um, contained within the people within the organization. So people make the difference. And, you know, accountants like to argue with us um, around this fact, but I've never seen a convincing argument that that it's that it's not people who make the difference so i mean if you think about a construction company it's someone needs to drive the digger loader an organization can have the fanciest offices the best equipment the best technology the best tools but without people the organization just doesn't exist so it's people that actually give the organization life and it's people that make the fundamental difference in the effectiveness and efficiency of an organization. And that, that's why it's so important not to take a recruitment and selection process lightly. It's a very, very important part of, of business accountability. And I think one of the key things that leaders um, in an organization is accountable for is to ensure that they actually employ people into the organization that's going to maximize that three cycle value creation process. That's of course the aim of recruitment and selection. What are we trying to do? We're trying to identify individuals who's going to perform and who's going to stay. That's kind of your golden formula. If people perform and the performers actually stay within the organization. And why is that important? Because as leaders in an organization or managers or in an organization or HR people in an organization, part of our fundamental accountability is to mitigate risk to the business. That's what we are accountable for. So every decision that we make is actually a risk mitigation type of decision. So if we don't take the process of recruitment and selection seriously, and if we don't make sure that the, that the tools and the methods that we use are effective and efficient and actually does the job well, then I don't think we're doing the, the organization a, a justice. We're not doing a, delivering a great service to the organization and we're not mitigating risk to the business. So, I mean, you can just imagine how you would open up the business to risk if you just randomly select people into your business. It makes absolutely no sense. So risk mitigation is actually for me at the core of good recruitment and selection as well. And that's a leadership accountability. Leaders are accountable to mitigate and manage risk in the business. And also what is important is talent management, HR management is, is not an HR function anymore. It is a line function. HR should serve the role of consultant um, or, or they should actually guide the process and the thinking through, through theory and models. But the implementation and the and, and kind of the trenches sit with line management. So talent management is a line function and that's very important for business people to start understanding. And I still find that there's a bit of a disconnect with that. Always when there's a people issue, they tend to kind of just run to HR. Um, not when the people do well, but often when the people don't do well, then it's HR's problem and not, not the line manager's problem anymore. If they do well, then the line manager is, is very willing to take, take credit. Um, so risk mitigation is very important to form part of your, your argument towards the business. This is actually some, here's some interesting stats. So I know it's a bit commercial. It's not from the most scientific um, kind of articles, but look at The Economist. Unsuccessful hiring is the single biggest problem in business today. Harvard Business Review, 80% of employee turnover is due to bad hiring decisions. A third of a new hire's annual salary to replace. That means that's the cost of replacement. There's different stats around here around how much it costs to replace a, a new um, 
employee that you've appointed. Um, the, so um, the Society for Human Resource Management even says it's up to five times an individual's annual salary to replace them. Mm -hmm. And if you have to replace a person within the first six months, um, it could even cost you between uh, or up to two and a half times the person's salary. So if we get this recruitment and selection process wrong, in other words, if we bring in the wrong person, um, it does entail cost. And there's a risk, again, in the business or, or, or for the business in that. So again, risk mitigation is important because we know if you get it wrong, um, it does have a fundamental impact and not only a monetary impact, it also has an impact on engagement, it has an impact on energy, it has an impact on motivation of the people within the team. So it's very, very important to actually pay close attention to getting the recruitment and selection process as efficient and effective as possible. So I'm going to move to the next slide. So here's kind of the first fundamental conclusion that I want to draw. It makes absolute business sense to hire first time right. Now, I haven't heard anyone when I do these presentations, even if they're in finance or where IT or wherever they sit, it's, it's not an argument that you can really argue against. So in order to mitigate the business against risk, it's absolutely fundamental and it makes business sense to hire first time right. And that's important to understand. This is always quite interesting to look at the, the monetary value of above average performers. So what are we trying to do in the business? We're trying to employ people who's going to add maximum value to the three cycle value creation process, input, conversion, output. And very often the people that actually add the most significant value to that process are people in the business that actually perform at the above average range. So they typically say one standard deviation above the mean. Now, this is just a normal bell shape distribution, but what the research actually shows us, and this is quite an interesting um, finding for me, is that if we take the mean or the average as a base point, as let's say we call that a base point of one, if you are able through a valid and reliable process or the use of valid and reliable tools to identify the people who's going to perform one standard deviation above that mean, you're going to get 40% return on investment value from a monetary perspective. If you appoint people who perform one standard deviation below the mean, you're going to lose 40% return on investment. So if a person here earns one rand, it means that if you appoint people in the above average range, that you'll get one rand 40 back from them. And that's how the 40% increase actually um, is distributed. Two standard deviations above the mean, you get up to 80% um, monetary value return on your investment. So guys, it absolutely makes sense again to try and identify people throughout your recruitment and selection process that is that is able to perform at that above average range. I just want to every now and then look at the chat box. Okay, I see it's still just names for, could I want you to please keep a keep a um, yes. eye on the chat box for me. So if anything pops out, just, just shout out to me. So guys, what we need to start talking about is return on investment. That's very important um, from a business perspective. We cannot just talk uh, about the fact that the, the person feels good in the organization or they fit well to the organization. What does that mean? The business is here to, to essentially make money um, and to deliver a service or a product at a, a, um, profitably. That's, that's why a business exists. And why do, you, do we want businesses to do that? Because it's got individual value. People that work in the business actually enrich their lives. The government gets taxes um, through effective and efficient or productive organizations. So it's very, very important that our recruitment and selection processes has the ability to actually identify these above average performers um, from a pool of applicants. This is also quite interesting, just sticking with some of the value that we can see with above average performing employees. And this is a meta-analytical study that was done. Um, and it's very interesting. I can also share that research with you. But the top 1% of employees are between 50% to 127% more productive than the average performing workers. And this is also dependent on the complexity of the job. So the more complex the job, the bigger the impact. So people higher up in the organization does make a bigger impact in terms of overall productivity in the organization. For low complexity jobs, 
in other words, unskilled or semi-skilled blue collar workers, the top 1% of workers are three times as productive as the bottom 1% of workers. For medium complexity jobs, in other words, technicians and supervisors, the top 1% of workers are 12 times more productive than the bottom 1%. So it alternatively stated one employee in the top 1% is worth 12 people in the bottom 1%. So guys, you can clearly see that if we actually employ above average performers or, or excellent performers in the business, there's a significant return on productivity um, and on investment if, we, if, we, if our process is able to help us identify those top performers. Also, another slide that's very interesting, this is the percentage more output by above average employees when comp compared to average employees. So on average, above average employees contribute 19% more from a productivity perspective when compared to average performing employees. In, in skilled positions, individuals add 32% more productivity when compared to average performing employees. And in managerial and professional work, think leaders, managers in the organization, above average performing employees are actually 48% more productive um, than average performing employees. Just imagine the impact of these increases in productivity on a business if we're actually able to employ above average and excellent performing individuals in the business. It has a massive impact on the overall productivity in the business. So part of our aim is to ensure, and it makes absolute business sense, that we try and employ above average to excellent performing employees in our business. That should be our aim with recruitment and selection. It's not only about fit. Yes, fit is critically important, but it's also about identifying the people who's going to outperform the average performing employees in our business. So, of course, the, the, the next question that we need to ask is, what does the right person for the job look like? What are we looking for in our recruitment and selection process? So I like to um, just display this picture. It's not 100% academically correct, but it's definitely digestible. So I want to take you just through this picture of what, what we look for, or what we should look for throughout recruitment and selection. Of course, we all, if we start right at the bottom here, we, we, we've got the, the fact that we exist mean that we've got, that we've got um, parents um, and our parents and our family lineage gave us a specific genetic disposition and then whether our parents allowed us to play with blocks or puzzles or whatever um, and nurtured, nurtured us in the right manner um, then affects the way we also or our dispositions and also our attainments. So this is the age-old nature and nurture debate. That's where it all starts. Nature and nurture actually feeds into what we can do from an attainment and disposition perspective. So dispositions, you've got to think kind of personality. In other words, what would be your preferences, your typical dispositions um, towards the world? So attainments, the underlying attainments and dispositions that's driven by our nature and our nurture actually feeds into what we call abilities and attributes. Now, abilities and attributes are still below the surface. It's not really what we see above the first surface, but it's expressed in two core domains of competencies. In other words, task-related competencies, as well as contextual-related competencies. When we do psychometric assessments, as an example, we try and measure at this level the underlying abilities and attributes that drive what we see above this above the surface. The most important thing to understand, however, from this picture is that our recruitment and selection process should evaluate fit of an employee across both the task related competencies as well as the contextual related competencies. So what do we mean by task related competencies? What we mean here is does the person have the skills to do the job? Do they have the knowledge to do the job? Do they have the understanding to do the job? So experience, exposure, education, what you've done, attainments, abilities, all become very important here. And very often what we do to assess this would be kind of skills-based assessments or, or cognitive assessments. We also tend to focus quite a lot on this in our um, recruitment and selection process. A lot of managers focus and zone into the task-related competencies. In other words, they ask a lot of technically-based questions, but they neglect also the contextual fit. In other words, does the person have the right attitude? 
are they likely to display the behaviors that's in line with our culture and in line with what the job requires? Are they or is the synchronicity between the individual's values and our organizational values? So this is all contextual performance. So this would be where they can play and this would be how an individual plays at that level. Now, what is also important, remember I mentioned that a lot of recruitment and selection processes only focus on task-related competencies and then neglect the contextual-related competencies. Always rem remember this age-old management saying, you're hired because of technical competence and you're fired because of personality. So that's very often true. So what we see when I speak to managers in an organization, it's seldom, very, very seldom that they complain about the person doesn't have the right level of skill or the knowledge or the understanding. Mostly what managers complain about is the fact that the person doesn't have the right attitude. They don't have the right behavior. They don't display the right values. They don't have the energy. They're not detail conscious. They're not a team player, whatever the case might be. And I want to urge you to make sure that your recruitment and selection process correctly, accurately assesses both across the task related competencies and the contextual related competencies. And if you do that well, and you need to go through a process of a good job analysis and competency analysis to determine what would be important here. If you do that well, then you're able to identify the right person for the job, which will then be the, the competent employee. Kuna, are you still with me? I'll just check in with you every now and then. Yeah, 100%. I can't agree with you more. Um, okay, does that make sense? Yeah, <clears throat> no, for sure. So, Yes, we talk about fit. Now, this model has, has of course, been extended quite a lot. Um, you now get person, organization, job fit. There's also person, organization, job, team fit. Uh, they've even expanded it to person, job, organization, team, and manager fit. Um, but let's keep it simple. Let's keep it person, organization, mm -hmm. job fit. Um, but our aim with recruitment and selection is to actually ensure that we have fit between the person, the organization, and the job. And as I mentioned, fit is, is, is okay, but good fit is better because good fit means mm. that it's much more likely that the person would be that above average to excellent um, performer in the business. But our aim is to drive fit. That's what we need to do through recruitment and selection. I'm taking a long-winded approach to get to psychometrics, but I do want you to understand the argument um, for psychometrics. So what are we trying to do? So when we've got, a, uh, got an applicant pool and we've got a position and we're in an organization um, and we want to ensure fit, we have to do something at this present moment in order to predict future performance. So in order to achieve this aim of fit, we need tools or we need methods of prediction. In other words, we need tools that's going to give us some sort of valid and reliable insight into future performance. And what's also very important is that the tool needs to be relevant in terms of what we're trying to achieve. So there needs to be some sort of relationship between the tool that we're using or the measure that we're using um, and future performance. So in other words, if I want to appoint an accountant as an example, but I ask questions about human resource management and the person's not going to manage people, then, then, then the questions that I'm asking in my mm. interview or the tool that I'm using or the substance that I'm evaluating fit on doesn't make sense to me. So there always needs to be a relationship between what we're trying to do um, and, and predicting performance. So yeah. you have to understand that when, we, then when people apply for a position, we don't have insight into whether they'll perform or not. So we need some sort of tool that's going to help us gain that insight into potential, into competency potential of future job performance. And that's why we do things like psychometrics or we do competency-based interviews. Um, so, so what is the criteria for a good tool? This is, of course, very, very important because we can have very good tools or we can have a crooked ruler, um, as an example. And if we use a crooked ruler, we're going to get crooked data, which means we base our decisions on crooked data, which then would drive down the effectiveness and efficiency of, of those decisions. So they need to be accurate. That's of course, think of a ruler. A ruler is a great example because a ruler is accurate. Every time you use a ruler, it's going to give you an accurate um, insight of length. So what the tool that, we, that we're using should actually be measuring what we wanted to measure. Um, and it, it needs to be able to predict what we wanted to predict. So think broad terms validity here needs to be accurate. 
The mm -hmm. other thing that, that we need is we need consistent accuracy. So if we've got a tool as a, let's, let's use a, a ruler example again. If, we, if the centimeters on our ruler could shift and we measure today um, the length of something and tomorrow it's shifted and we measure the same thing again, but we get a different reading, a different length, then it means that the tool that we're using is not consistently accurate. So it needs to be accurate, but it also needs to be consistently accurate. So those are two very important criteria for a successful tool. And it's oversimplified, I get that, but validity and reliability of tools are critically important to understand and to adhere to. If there's no validity, if there's no reliability, it's a crooked ruler, and basically the data that you, that you get would not be useful um, for a recruitment and selection process. So, there's a question here, Johanna, if I can two, just pop in. Yeah, please. Um, please. There's a question here saying the contextual competencies will work well for employees already in the organization. So what do we apply to new employees? How do we, how do we, Mariam, maybe if you want to ask your question. That's it. Um, yeah, um, thank you very much, Joanne. Um, yes. I think, yeah. I think, I believe that um, when it comes to contextual related competencies, it's something that's yeah. very difficult to measure, especially for new employees that are entering the organization. You don't know them. You don't know their behavior, attitude. Yeah. You know? Sure, that's, yes. a, that's, that's a great question. And, and yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I really appreciate that question. Look, it's, it's, it's not an easy thing to do, but there's certainly, if you do a good competency analysis, there certainly would be specific competencies that would make a person more successful in the role. So, so instead of analyzing the, the, the individual, you need to start with what are the critical competencies and behaviors that we expect from an individual in this role. Once you've extracted those, then it's very easy to use something like psych psychometrics to, or a competency-based exercise to compare people to the ideal that you're looking for in the organization. Um, so I would say just to answer that question in short, make sure that you evaluate or extract the competencies that are required. Remember, competencies are actually defined by behavioral indicators. As soon as we've got behavioral indicators, behaviors are very often driven by traits and dispositions. So if we understand the competencies and we can map traits and dispositions to those competencies, we can match an individual's, for instance, just as an example, personality profile to the competency requirements. So again, we can predict the likelihood that the individual will display those behaviors. So even though it's difficult, um, it's possible if you go through a good process of competency analysis. Does that answer the question? Yeah, um, it does partly so we've, we, because, because I remember. A, yeah, go. I, I worked for F and B. Yes. Know, whereby we had this employee who performed very well in the interview. Their behavior was, you know, right and everything. But later on, after three months, age things changed. Yeah. And what, so what, I remember, what, what do you expect? That, I was looking for a job. <laughs> yeah. Did the, did the individual go through psychometrics? Um, that's just, just one question. That, or did they only go through an interview process? Uh, she went through um, a psychometric um, assessment as well. Okay. Now, now yeah. this is also important to understand. So the first key thing is that you correctly extract or that you correctly identify um, the, the behaviors that, that would make a person successful in the job. That's the one <laughs> The second part that you need is you need to actually then use valid and reliable tools that give you accurate and consistently accurate insight into what you want to measure. But another thing about validity that a lot of people don't understand is the conclusions that you draw from the data. In other words, the, the conclusions that I draw um, as a psychologist from the data also impacts validity. So if my conclusions are wrong, it could impact the accuracy of the interpretation, which is, which is of course, very important. So I think um, where you need to start is start with how good was our competency analysis? Did we look at the light, right stuff? Secondly, did we actually use the right tools to get insight into the stuff that we're looking for? And then thirdly, the conclusions that we draw 
or drew from the data collected, was that accurate and valid? And I think that's, that's where I would start the investigation. Because it looks like there was a, there was a fit thing that, that, that was an issue there. Yeah. Guys, I just want to get back, back on track here. Um, so, so what are we trying to do? Remember, essentially the tools of prediction, so the tools that we're using, should allow us to consistently make more accurate selection decisions. That's a good tool. That's a good method. In other words, it should select people into the organization who will perform and accurately reject people who will not perform. So this is a, this is a picture that you very often come across in industrial, psychology, in, in industrial psychology. So what does that statement say at the top? It says that our tools or methods or approach should allow us from a pool of applicants to identify individuals who we call true positives. Um, they were accepted in the selection process and they also performed successfully in the job. True negatives are the people that we need to reject in our process. They're likely to fail and our process also indicates that they're likely to fail. A bad process, a bad tool, a bad um, approach or methodology Actually, also, you see interference here with the false negatives and false positives. Those are people who scored well in the assessment or the interview, like you're just saying in that specific example, but then they didn't perform. So maybe there was a problem with the tools of prediction and the interpretation of the data. Um, or we get people that we rejected and, and they actually, if we did appoint them, they, they would have performed well in the business. So always our tools, our methods, should increase true positives and should also increase true negatives and try and limit the false negatives and false positives. So that's just also important to keep in the back of your mind. So how do we know that a measure or tool is a good measure or tool? So this is important. We need scientific evidence proving that there is a relationship with it, between the tool and the measure that we are using and performance. So in South Africa, um, Kun, you can inform me also about Namibia, but we are actually obliged to be able to supply that scientific evidence um, of use. So in other words, we're saying that there's a correlation um, between the tool that we're using and also performance. Um, if such a relationship exists, then the tool or the measure can be used to predict future performance. It's oversimplified, I get that. So if there's any statisticians or in-depth psychometrists or psychologists here, it's oversimplified, but it makes it, again, digestible. But in yeah. simple terms, it helps us to make better selection decisions. So if, if we are able to provide the scientific evidence and, and there's a relationship between the tool that we use and what we're trying to predict, in other words, performance, um, then, it's, then, then it's a tool that we, that we should use and we, and we can actually use. And so it's very, very important in your business, especially if you're in an organization where you consistently use assessments or even interviews, it's very important to actually look at the scientific data that supports the use of that tool. If you don't have that scientific data, then it's actually speculation. We speculate about, about whether the tool works or not. And what's also important that people tend to, to forget is the fact that Validity and reliability information is not automatically transferable to a new situation. So if a tool works in FNB and it predicts performance for financial consultants in FNB, it's a good starting point to say, I want to use it in another bank, Standard Bank as an example. But it doesn't immediately imply that it would work in Standard Bank. So first we need to determine whether it works or not. So a lot of test providers, and I'm not a test provider, but a lot of test providers will sell you validity and, and reliability. But the question still remains, okay, that's a, that's a good point to start, but will it work in my environment and we need to test it in my environment? So um, psychometrics is definitely not just automatically transferable from one, or, 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 um, I mean, validity and, and reliability statistics is not immediately just transferable. So guys, what do we, what do we talk, this is now stats 101. So a one indicator of um, predictive validity, in other words, validity that, that the tool is predicting performance is a correlation coefficient. You guys should know this well. Minus one is a perfect negative um, correlation and plus one is a perfect positive correlation. This is how you should interpret the guide. So guys, when you sit with a 0.3 to 0.5 correlation, that's significant in, in the social sciences. That's a really, really strong correlation. Um, in the social sciences. Very often it sits um, at 0.3 when we talk about, about correlations in the social sciences. But I want to just show you 
um, a little bit of a picture. So that's not important. That's South African um, information, just about correlation. So a tool or method or a procedure that is more valid, this is important to understand, that's more accurate and more consistently accurate, allows us to make better selection decisions. The higher the validity, the higher the reliability, the, the more likely or the higher the probability that we'll actually make a correct um, decision or inference that's given that we draw valid conclusions from the data that we do gather. So the accuracy of decisions, selection and recruitment decisions is directly linked to the validity of a tool or a method or an approach. An invalid tool can lead to decisions that are both ineffective and most importantly also unfair, could lead to bias against people. So what works? This is also, I think this is the research by Schmidt and Hunter, also a meta-analysis. So these are correlation coefficients that you get, that you see here. General mental ability, and it's about um, correlation with performance. General mental ability, GMA, has a correlation coefficient of 0.51. So in the social sciences, again, that's quite a strong correlation. Work sample tests, in other words, you're a mechanic, you apply for a position, I ask you, Put this engine together. That's a typical work sample test. Correlation coefficient of 0.54. Integrity measures also great 0.41. And so the list goes on. Now what's interesting, there's a few interesting things here. How often do we screen people out on years of education or also job experience? So we often say in our ads, you need five years experience or 10 years experience. But the correlation between job experience and performance is very low. So it's not a good criteria to base decisions on. So I always wonder what will happen if people start challenging the years that we put in our job descriptions or in our ads, um, because the science is quite, quite clear about that. It's not a good thing to, dis to distinguish good or bad on. In France, they still use graphology. So they analyze handwriting to, um, to infer your personality. There's almost no correlation there. Even interest, you know, what are, what are your interests? And even if we measure interests, very low correlation as well with that. Um, here you can see unstructured interviews are still, are still okay. It's definitely better than using graphology, um, but structured <laughs> competency-based interviews are definitely much better than unstructured interviews as well. Um, okay, now this is, this is quite interesting and I love to bring up this slide. So if you can just remember some of the, these, the good ones, you know, 0 0.51, 0 0.41, 0 0.31 is still okay, 0 0.51 we've got there. Look how well our science measures up to things that we often assume to be true. So people say if you've got a heart problem, you've got to go for coronary artery bypass surgery. Um, and will that make your heart stable? Um, and will you survive after five years? The correlation is 0 0.08. So almost no correlation. Drink an mm -hmm. aspirin, it's going to actually thin your blood and reduce your risk of death by heart attack. It doesn't, it's not true. The correlation coefficient is 0 0.02. Look at this interesting one. You have to be bubbly, extroverted, outgoing to be good at sales. Not true. Correlation is 0 0.08. Don't watch violent movies. It's going to make you aggressive. Also very low correlation. Take a nicotine patch. It's going to help you to stop smoking. 0.18, way worse than any of our signs. All people that drink become aggressive. Not true. Look at Viagra, multi-billion dollar industry. Viagra and improved male sexual functioning. It's, like, it's, it's comparable to an unstructured interview. So very, very low um, correlation efficiency as well. Ex, uh, ECG, go for an ECG. Um, it will help you to identify coronary artery disease. Also, that's about almost on par with cognitive ability assessments. The reason why I want to just bring up that slide is because our science, the proof that our tools are actually good, outperform a lot of things that we kind of as lay people assume to be true. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. And our science actually outperforms medical science on a regular basis. So that's now great, but can we do even better? Yes, we can. How do we do better? We use a multi-method, multi-assessor type of approach. So what you can see here, this specific research says, let's start with general mental ability. What happens to our correlation coefficient if we then add a work sample test? You can immediately see that it jumps to a correlation coefficient of 0.63. Or what happens if we combine general mental ability 
with an integrity test, 0.65, you can see very, very strong correlations. Or what happens if we combine it with a um, structured or unstructured or structured interview, 0.63. So you can see that if we use this multi-method, multi-assessor type of approach, we can definitely push up our correlation coefficients. Why do they always combine general mental ability with other, with, with other things? Because general mental ability over many, many years, many, many research papers are still a very good and consistent predictor of performance across levels and across roles. So it's definitely something that you must include in your psychometric assessment batteries. But the point here is if we combine good tools, yes, the combination of too much tools actually makes the process saturated. So at some stage, the tools do not add any value anymore. But if you combine the right tools, um, you can definitely ensure the accuracy and the consistent accuracy of your prediction as well. So just the third business conclusion for me is it makes absolute business sense to use more valid tools as part of our selection process. Can we start it a bit later? Um, are you still happy for me to carry on? I see we on about 20 or 52 minutes past 10. Or is it, is it kind of cutting off at 11? I think um, people have probably allocated about an hour for this. Okay. Um, if there are any further questions and people who would like to stay on, I've got a thousand things to say. I'm biting my tongue on this side. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be finished soon. So let's, let's, let's yeah, go. Through. Let's go. <clears throat> so yeah, okay. So that was a hell of a lot of stats and and information. But the but the point is just key things that I that I want to convey up until this point. It makes sense to employ above average employees in order to identify those people. We need good tools. We need valid, accurate reliable tools in order to help us identify those true positives and eliminate the true negatives. That's very, very important. And then also we need scientific evidence of what we're doing, that it, that it is actually um, working and that it does make sense. The fourth thing is, is if you do gather that evidence, it builds a very, very strong business case over time as well. So I would say that if you use psychometrics in your business, you have to go into the process of actually doing validation research. Otherwise, you are speculating. You're not, you don't actually know whether it works. And that's why businesses get so frustrated with us, is because we never go into the process of actually proving our worth. Now, how, how do we actually prove our worth? Utility. Utility is the analysis that we use to prove our worth. I'm not going to go into the detail of, of, of utility. I've got a few examples, but it's, it's, it's quite in-depth and in detail. But utility is basically looking at the overall usefulness of a personnel selection or placement procedure or tool or method. The concept includes both the accuracy and the importance of personnel decisions. Moreover, utility implies a concern with costs related to setting up and implementing personnel selection procedures and costs associated with errors in the decision making. So it actually answers the following question. What does all the statistical mumbo jumbo mean in rand cent value? So if we actually do our validation research and we've got our validation coefficients and we've got our selection race ratios, we can actually prove to the business, um, the, the, and I call it now rand cent value, it's probably dollar value for you guys. Um, we can actually prove that to the business. And that's what the business wants to see. They want to see whether what they're investing in makes sense from a money perspective. Otherwise, we just, and, and that's the PowerPoint Excel thing that, that, we, that we tend to miss often. So why should I use a more valid method um, than my gut? You know, we see a lot of managers asking, I can sense in the first five minutes when the person is right or not. Um, gut, if, of course, is very um, invalid. Um, there's not a lot of, of research that supports a manager or leader's gut sense. Um, so here's just a simple example. What do we need? We need the validity coefficient of the current method. We need the validity coefficient of the proposed method. Um, the standard deviation on performance distribution, let's assume that's 40%, as I said, above average performers give you 40% more return on investment. Um, and then we also need the average standard score obtained during the selection procedure. So just an example, if we use an unstructured interview versus a combination of general mental ability and integrity, I'm not going to go into the calculation, but the calculation is pretty simple. Because there's a difference, the, the, the um, unstructured interview, remember, had a validity coefficient of 0.38, where the um, 
combination of general mental ability and integrity had a ability co coefficient of 0.65. So if you have to convince a manager, why should you rather use this method than that method? A utility analysis is what you need to do. You can see in, if you appoint 10 employees using the new method above the old method, um, you'll get a 10,800 rand. It's now a very simple example. Um, on average, more output from individuals that perform in the above average range using this tool as compared to this tool. So 10 employees over five years, you'll actually get a return on investment of 540,000 rand. So by using this new tool, you can actually get a 9% um, increase in output. So guys, mm -hmm. the calculations are quite, quite complex, but it's, it's very clear that this is, these are the types of calculations that we actually need to put, put forward um, for a business. Very often a manager question that we get, okay, fair enough, I'm not willing to pay however, $4,500 or 4,500 rand, that's still cheap for an assessment. It's too expensive. Again, we can do, we can do a little utility um, calculation here. So let's see what we, what, what, what we come out of. So here we've got general mental ability and an unstructured interview on the other side. So again, the manager says, I've got good gut, I can just use this. It's untrue. So over time, when you use the more valid and reliable method above the, 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 the more invalid method, um, you can have actually, if, you, if you're appointing 10 people and they stay for two years, um, and there's a, there's a standard deviation of 80,000 Rand and you use, you pay 4,500 Rand per person to do this and 350 Rand or dollars per person to do the unstructured interview. It's much cheaper, but there's a cost to it. So if you use this, you'll actually save $1.231 million as opposed to just 8.5 or $851,000. So you get much more return on investment by using that more valid valid method um okay so again just one last one okay so it starts making so utility can give you um insight into the the savings that you'll get the percentage more productivity that you'll get by using a methodology and then lastly you're also able to predict um the probability of success which is which is which is quite nice so if you've got again your correlation coefficient that sit here. And if you say that 50%, just as an example, 50% of the employees that we employ are high or, or perform satisfactory and 50% do not. And you've got a validity coefficient, let's use cognitive ability of 0.5, of 0.5. remember it was 0.51. If you use a tool with this correlation coefficient and you select the top 20% in your applicant pool, the top 20% has got a 78% probability of performing the role successfully. If you select the next 20%, it's only a 62% probability of success. The middle 20%, 50%, and so the percentages go down. So you can also see we can actually give businesses insight into probability of success. So how wonderful would it be if we administer psychometric assessment battery and we can give a business insight into Johannes got a 78% probability of being successful versus Kun. Sorry, Kun, that's only got a 39% probability of, <laughs> of performing successful. And that makes it much more, it's what we call criterion related interpretation of psychometrics. It makes it, makes it much more effective. So what managers also very often struggle with is they, now they've got all these sources of information and pieces of information. Then the question becomes, how do we actually combine it? And the research is quite clear on this as well. You must use a simple equation to combine your data. So remember with the use of psychometrics, we've got two approaches. We've got a clinical approach and an actuarial approach. A clinical approach is where the psychologists, and we often do this, where the psychologists say, here's the person's profiles, and I draw inferences of fit from those profiles. An actuarial approach means you've done a regression analysis, and you plug scores into a formula, and it gives you a rank order of candidates. And what's interesting is it's an actuarial approach outperforms a clinical pro approach um, by at least 25% consistently. And what the research also shows, interestingly enough, even if you write the, if your equation is wrong, 
it still outperforms a clinical approach because a clinical approach, approach is much more open to inconsistency and human error. Um, so I would definitely um, encourage you to put the scores that you get, interview scores, in combination with psychometric scores in some sort of formula to help you rank all the candidates that apply for a position. But I think that's a topic for another day. So just to conclude, we all want better performing businesses. People contribute significantly to business performance. I don't think that's up for debate. Above average performers um, contribute more so than average performers and even more so than below average performers. Therefore, we need to employ people with the highest likelihood to be above average performers. And in order to identify these people, we need to apply tools um, that has scientific, so I don't know why the no is there, that has scientific, scientific proof behind it as a predictor. Psychometric assessments very often have such proof of predictive validity. Remember, it's not strong, transferable, but using valid tools like psychometric assessments assists us to make more correct selection decisions more often. It increases the likelihood of hiring employees that produce higher output, and it also increases the likelihood of saving money over the long run. So that's the conclusion of my story. Guys, it was very technical and scientific, but I hope at least um, there's some foundation for you guys to build an argument on. Great stuff. Thank you so much, Johan. Um, as I said, I've got so much to add and so many more things I'd like to say. Um, <clears throat> so here's a question saying, the HR practitioner requires additional skills to utilize uh, methodology, tools, et cetera, to convince the organization and demonstrate ROI. Um, I think one of the things that maybe you, that was un, unsaid or, or maybe implied is from HR, we need to be able to identify the dollar value that each person contributes to the organization. Once you know what your good performers contribute, and what your poor performers contribute, then you can start plugging in these calculations and say, listen, if we improve our selection process by X percentage, um, you know, a simple example, you I was referring there to a 0.5 correlation or 50% likelihood of fit, which is basically flipping a coin. You know, you've got a 50-50 chance. And a lot of our interview processes, so we're saying every 10 people we hire, only five of them are high performers. If you can get that number from five to seven, imagine how much extra value there will be in the, in the organization. Yeah, so, that's so, massive. Yeah. yeah, you know, so, so we need to try to identify the dollar value of what somebody contributes to the organization and what's the difference between poor performers um, and top performers. Because, um, and, and I will, like I said, I've got lots of stuff to say, so I'll leave it here. But the final comment is, with the poor performers, there are so many um, hidden costs that we don't see. The amount of times that, that leaders have to sit and spend time coaching the poor performers, dealing with poor performance issues, um, you know, redoing work that they've done poorly, those, those things are not quantified. Whereas with the top performer or the high performer, the person just gets on with the job and they get it done. So in terms of hours lost and time that's spent by getting poor performers to be, um, you know, to be good performers, I think in time, the better people you hire with better processes, your managers will start to buy into this process and say, listen, these are the type of people I want, um, you know, because it makes my life as a line manager so much easier to have good people on my team than to have poor people on the team. Yeah, Kuna, I think, I think that's, that's so important. And, and I think the fundamental thing that I want to convey with this type of presentation is that the days of HR people just talking about kind of it feels good, it looks good, it, there's not a table for those people in the boardroom or a chair for those people around the table in the boardroom. It, it doesn't fly anymore. Businesses expect return on investment and they expect us to be able to talk about return on investment and to prove our worth. Um, that's, it's as simple as that. And if, if we as the HR community is not willing or unable to make that shift to actually be able to talk a business language, then, we, then we're going to struggle in the business world and we're going to keep struggling in the business world. And that's, that's why it's so important for us to, to, to make that, that shift in our, in our minds. Now, it's not natural 
for a um, for a HR person to make that shift. You know, a HR person very often is a little bit more right brain, and I'm stereotyping here, but but in order to actually um, convince a business, we need to actually vamp up or dial up our ability to to, to speak business sense. Otherwise, we Otherwise, people don't take us seriously. And, and that for me would be a, because we've got a hell of a lot of value to add. And, and, and the science speaks for itself. And if we're not able to do that, then, we, then we're actually going to not be seen as valuable in an organization. Mm. I mean, coming back to the other uh, point you were raising about the, the, the cost of interviews. I've sat in an interview where, where they flew in an external expert from South Africa, paid for his hotels and everything to be in Namibia for a couple of days. We had the whole board of directors, which was sort of five or six people, plus manager of HR, plus the CEO, uh, close to eight people in a very serious appointment. Uh, if you had to take those people's annual salary or monthly salary and divide it by 48 hour or, or 40 hours of work, and you come up with a dollar number for the amount of money that you're actually spending on having those people in the interview. And then they say, okay, but I don't want to pay four and a half thousand for the, for the assessment. <laughs> you know? yeah, 100% good. yeah, 100% correct. So, so yeah. So, so Kun, if you had to, that's that one analysis. If you had to actually calculate the cost of that interview process um, and compare it to the validity and the cost of a, of a good um, scientific psychometric assessment, mm -hmm. Um, over time, the one process is definitely going to cost the company, where the other one is is probably going to contribute um, significantly over time because you're going to be able to identify those true positives much more accurately. Yeah. Um, and 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 that's and that's the key. The other thing, just talking, coming back to the the, the upgrading skills, I, I agree with that. We actually need additional skills to be able to talk this language. We need insight into diagnostics. We need insight into measurement. Um, theory. A lot of people just think they can slap a few questions together and there you've got an engagement survey if you've got a performance measure. It's not as simple as that. Um, yeah. And, and I, in fact, when we look at, um, we've scientifically evaluated a lot of um, performance measures in organizations and they, and they consistently fall flat. There's, there's no reliability or val validity behind it. So then, mm -hmm. then people say, but at least it stimulates conversation. And then I say, well, you, 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 you're conversing on data that's completely irrelevant. So you, you, you're talking to me about the fact that I'm 3.2 meters tall. Well, that's not the reality. So, so, right. so, so we need to understand measurement theory. That's critically important. And then secondly, in my opinion, we need to be able to, to speak business sense to business-minded people. Yeah, I think maybe just to, to, to add to that comment I just made, I'm not saying that we shouldn't do interviews. What yeah. I'm saying yeah, yeah, exactly is exactly. If we are doing that interview, let us identify already before the interview who's not going to be a good fit. Let's not use the interview to, to, to weed out people, 100%. but to identify before the interview who is likely to be a good fit and then interview already the ones who, you know, say five out of five will be a good fit. We just need to yeah. pick the best one out yeah. of the five. Uh, um, you correct. Want to thank you for your time. Yes. Um, maybe just a comment from your side. Um, and then we can wrap up. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, I think I think the the key thing for me that I that I also wanted to say is just just in terms of the contextual fit. I've, I know that it's difficult, but there's also nice personality assessments um, that allow you to first analyze the context, and then you can actually take the individual's personality profile and correlate the two. You overlap the two, and that also gives you a good indication of fit. Um, Mm -hmm. so, so, but, but remember your process needs to start with analysis. It needs to start with job analysis, competency analysis. Doesn't matter what you do after that. If this foundation is not in place, your, your house will be built on sand. And, and you yeah. also then, then, then open the business up to, to risk because you evaluating a person on potentially job irrelevant um, constructs. But could it was a, it, um, I'm a, yeah, I like, I like the psychometrics. It frustrates me sometimes that people don't, get, don't understand the message or get the message, but we have to be champions for this. I, it, it makes a fundamental difference in a business. Um, and I think it's very, very important for HR people to start talking this language. I think that's going to really ensure a seat a, around the table within the boardroom. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Johan. Uh, can you pick a number for us between 1 and 21? <laughs> Let's go for... Number 14. 
Number 14, Tawanda. You have one or uh, two nights stay for two um, at the Zero in South Catering Cottages. I will contact you later with the details. Congratulations. Um, Johan, this has been brilliant. Um, I'm going to ask them if they would like to, um, <clears throat> to have an additional session maybe with yourself uh, to discuss that and maybe we can set that up because there's so much yeah. more to come. So. Yeah, it's nice. It's nice also to have a Q and A, you know, just to have a roundtable discussion. I'm very happy to to go into these discussions as well. Fantastic. So thank you very much. If everybody wants to unmute themselves and just say thank you to Johan, then we're going to leave it there, and we'll see you again in two weeks' time. Thank you very much, Johan. Thank you, Johan. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Johan. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you, Johan. Great. It was great to engage with you guys. In passion.